Oh, we, oh, we are on. We're just having a laugh at me doing this. <laughs> it's like a matrix of marks. Welcome to the ASV's June Astro Talk. Tonight we'll be treated to a presentation by Professor Alan Duffy on darkness visible down under and how Australia is playing a leading role in uncovering the nature of this mysterious dark matter. But before we begin, I would like to say that in spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of land throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community and we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Tonight's stream is proudly sponsored by Skywatcher and Sidereal Trading and remember that if you are watching and enjoying tonight's stream on Facebook you can donate stars uh, and those on YouTube can donate stickers. All donations, no matter how large or small, are welcome and greatly appreciated. And if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to subscribe on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, astronomer Professor Alan Duffy simulates model universes on supercomputers to understand how galaxies like our Milky Way form within the vast clouds of dark matter. He is trying to find this dark matter as the Swinburne node leader in the new National Arc Centre of Excellence for dark matter particle physics. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it's, it's really snappy, right? Yeah. It is very snappy. And is a chief investigator of SABRE, the world's first dark matter detector in the Southern Hemisphere, to be deployed at the Stahl Underground Physics Laboratory. Uh, when not simulating universes, he tries to explain the science of this to the general public in regular segments on ABC and tends the project as a lead scientist of the Royal Institute of Australia, Institution of Australia. Most recently, he was in, in appointed the inaugural director of the Space Technology and Industry Institute at Swinburne, finding ways to use space to help companies and communities here on Earth. Please welcome Professor Alan Duffy to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone, for, quite frankly, this incredible uh, honor to speak to you all uh, today. Before I begin, I'll uh, also add my um, uh, acknowledgement of the traditional custodians, in fact, of the land in which uh, the Institute is based, Swinburne is based, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'll pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be here or be watching on the stream. Now, tonight I want to try to explain to you why we are so confident that the world around us, everything that we can see combined, is outweighed five times over by a fundamentally invisible, completely hypothetical particle, we think, that you have never seen, tasted, or touched, but you owe your existence to it. Now, obviously, I'm standing in front of you saying this because we are quite confident about that, because we have quite a few lines of evidence to suggest that this dark matter is real. And in fact, we know a considerable amount about it, as hopefully I'll be able to convince you all as well. But before we go into the things that we can't see, I thought we'd do a quick tour of the things that we can. I don't think this is the audience that I need to explain these particular images to, but I always like to start off just as a reminder of just how uh, profoundly beautiful astronomy is when you're looking at things that actually emit or absorb light, as opposed to what I spend all my career doing, which is the stuff that doesn't, and that makes for very less impressive pictures. But here we can see large accumulations of gas and dust uh, blocking, uh, and indeed, uh, incredibly cold regions that begin to collapse under their own gravity, the density becoming ever larger in the central regions, becoming ever hotter until a certain key moment, the, the essentially uh, hot enough, dense enough that the uh, collisions between atoms occurs and we get uh, fusion or collision, direct collision of their um, uh, nuclei. And a star is born and in fact for certain stars so powerfully uh, uh, emitting in light and stellar winds, certainly the OB stars at the top here, they shred the, um, the cloud of gas and dust that gave birth to them, much like uh, any newborn will just absolutely destroy the creche that you put them in. <laughs> if you zoom out, you see, of course, that these accumulations of gas, dust, stars 
are housed in larger structures, of course, known as, as galaxies. And here's a lovely uh, little edge on um, uh, spiral. And in fact, we have this uh, flat um, uh, edge on uh, feature. And we can see that the dust lanes blocking the light from those uh, countless tens, perhaps hundreds of billions of stars. And then when we point the Hubble Space Telescope out at a random patch of, of the night sky, no bigger than your thumb outstretched with no discernible stars or objects within, and you allow the shutters to open over the course of many uh, cycles, the photons add up and a picture is revealed. Of course, familiar to you all, the uh, ultra deep field or the, the XDF now, where you see galaxies stretching all the way back. You're seeing, in particular, the very most uh, distant galaxies are just points of light. They're not stars in this image. They are all themselves galaxies as rich and, and diverse as the one above, perhaps. And when you then add up exactly how many galaxies must be in the observable universe, if this many thousands are hidden behind just the th single thumbnail held outstretched, you think just how big the sky is, you realize that there are trillions of galaxies, each of which having billions of stars and very likely as much material again in the gas and dust. And now I'm telling you that all of that added together is outweighed five times over by something fundamentally invisible to you. And I think perhaps we forget at how extraordinary that statement is. So how can we be so confident about that? Well, for one, because we can ask what the universe would look like if you didn't have this dark matter. And that's what I, that's what I do. That's my job, at least one of my jobs. I, as the intro showed, I have a few different hats. I create simulated universes. And you can start just after the Big Bang. You put in the ingredients you think that you need to form a, a galaxy, gas, dust, rules, laws for how stars form from it, gravity, of course and the ingredients. We add a large amount of additional dark matter and that makes all the difference because within the simulation you see here, orange is the gas, the dark matter is blue. Everything starts off smooth and then very quickly becomes clumpy. The, the, the gas begins to form these swirling uh, features within the extended dark matter halo. I've just slightly offset them because otherwise you, you just actually <laughs> wouldn't see which what is within which, but here we have this structure forming within the dark matter halo. And essentially, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all, and then we um, merge the images again. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the visible, the gas, uh, that's now forming stars, and the, uh, the dark matter that formed within. And the important point to realize is the dark matter starts to collapse first. It is the gravity that accelerates the collapse we can see to form galaxies, stars, and ultimately us. And in fact, without that extra gravity from the dark matter, you would just not have a galaxy by the present day. It speeds everything up. And there's a little uh, spiral galaxy. Um, supposed to be the Milky Way, but I think you can clearly tell there's quite a few more satellites around um, the, this simulated galaxy than ours, which means um, I got some of the laws of physics wrong in that simulation. Just minor details, not, not major ones. So if you ask, you do a baryonic census or a census of the matter in the universe and you ask how much visible to how much dark matter and, and certainly from those simulations, in a just bizarre example of numerology, do not overthink this. It makes no more great an impact than it's a cool visual. The, it is the exact ratio of visible to invisible material in our universe is that between the visible extent of an iceberg to what lies beneath the sea line. Spooky and completely coincidental. It makes no more, please no one submit any theories that connect those two. There, there's absolutely no distinct uh, connection between. But the visible amount uh, versus uh, relative to the dark matter, I say it's, it's about a one to five ratio, 17% visible. Which is, again, quite an extraordinary claim. So how do we come to this realization? Well. 
we have more than a few clues. And tonight I'm going to try to wh whistle through them all. Forgive me if I run a bit over time. There's, I, I, I'm trying to pick the key ones and I'm missing the cosmic microwave background, which is, which is terrible of me. But we're going to whistle stop through gravitational lensing. Uh, rotation curves, that's the classic Vera Rubin uh, approach. The large scale structure, which Australia has pioneered. In fact, Australia is, is uh, leading role in all of these efforts. We also have some indirect detection work, which I'll get to, uh, in particular, potential emission detected by gamma ray telescopes. And then finally, and most relevantly for tonight, and as the intro uh, uh, indicated, uh, the work of direct detection experiments like SABRE. But I'll get to all of that, which is hopefully going to spot the wind of dark matter. So let's start with gravitational lensing. With a show of hands, who knows what gravitational lensing is? Mm, OK, a lot of you are going to get quite bored in that case. All right. Hopefully, I can still tell you something fun and interesting and novel about it. Um, this is the seminal work uh, by Einstein back in 36, in which he described the uh, strong uh, gravitational lensing. And I wish I could write papers today that would go. Some time ago, Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation, which I have made as a request. This note complies with his wish. And there is the paper that explains strong gravitational lensing as a little calculation. Um, so essentially, it is seeing the invisible. And that is because in Einstein's theory, uh, matter will act like a lens and will bend the light from a, uh, a background source in a way that is exactly analogous to that of the lensing in a very familiar household object, that of a wine glass. So an experiment that you can do at home. I don't think we can do later on tonight. I don't think we've got any uh, wine glasses. But um, making a large dot on the piece of paper, like so, nice blue spiral galaxy for anyone, or you know, spiral, flat disk galaxy, similar to the one we saw earlier on. And then you move a wine glass over. And now this is the important point, not your fancy Riddell's. It has to have a stem, a good old fashioned wine glass. It doesn't work without that. So there we go. And then I'm going to show you the video in which we look down the lensing structure of the wine glass. And in particular, we're going to explore slightly different uh, uh, angles of alignment between us, the observer, the telescope, the lens, and background face on blue galaxy. And I want you to pay attention to the lensing effects. So here we go, moving around slightly different angles of, of orientation or alignment. Hopefully everyone's noting the effects. There is a quiz that comes after this. And just to check that there's no trickery, we remove it. OK, there we go. All right, so please do shout out. What do you see when it's right above? In other words, you're a perfectly aligned observer to telescope, uh, observer to lens to source. Symmetrical, symmetrical what? Circle. Symmetrical circle, yep. And have we got any other additions to that? Ring. Ring, yep, yep, all good stuff. Okay, yep, so we'll just remind ourselves that is where you have a perfect alignment. And sure enough, there is our ring. You can actually also see directly through the stem. I was wondering if anyone would point that out. Um, that's because you're looking through a stem of a wine glass. If you have a large amount of material, like a galaxy that is doing the lensing, it's very difficult to see through it. It's, it's got it itself, basically, gets in the way. So when we go out and we look, as Einstein would have uh, told us, this optical illusion, where we, by sheer chance, to find a galaxy between us and a background uh, uh, galaxy, well, we went looking for such an illusion. And there it is. This is a near-perfect. Einstein ring. There's almost a perfect alignment and indeed shape of the lens. And in fact, this, this object is essentially face on. I find that extraordinary that the, when you look out into the night sky, with, <laughs> at least with the Hubble, that you will see optical illusions. The whole universe is a hall of mirrors, which I, I find really tickles me. Now, this is a very unlikely chance alignment, as I mentioned. There's a lot of galaxies, a lot of interloping galaxies, but so even so, that's quite rare. Far more likely that you'll just be off angle. So in that instance, what does the look like? 
Now this is harder, right? Because everyone was real cocky and thought it was just the circle bit. But arcs, yes. Any advance on arcs? Equal arcs. Ooh, Einstein cross. Oh, interesting. Okay, um, we'll get to there. Uh, yes, more than one, and in particular, I was looking for asymmetric. But yes, we have a, a fatter or major arc, and the key is you have a on the opposing side. You have a minor arc, and again, this is a wine glass experiment. What has this got to do with the the real world and massive systems and 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 galaxies with hundreds of billions of solar mass? of material. Well, turns out exactly uh, analogous because here's our example now, not with a galaxy, but a cluster of galaxies lensing. And there's the major arc and there's the corresponding minor. But because this is a uh, not a single wine glass stem, and now I'm going to stretch the analogy to or metaphor to breaking point, but is a collection of such uh, uh, lensing stems, right? There's multiple galaxies all forming a very complex structure, you get lenses all over the place. And the longer you stare at this thing, as I've done, you really start to convince yourself there's you know, half a dozen at least. The key is that now you can play a bit of a game on a supercomputer, and you can just place lots of different test locations for those galaxies and see, can you match the lens? And indeed, you can do an extraordinary job of matching the structure. So the cluster is essentially um, uh, a collection of galaxies within a very much larger single dark matter halo. And around the galaxies, they have their own material as well, and that adds to the complexity. But this is what's happening. We're having the light traveling through a curved space-time being bent by a lens, and then it focuses on the observer. Um, I actually took out the image of the Einstein cross, so congrats to whoever said that that is another thing, but you can't do an Einstein cross with a lens of a wine glass stem. That just doesn't work. Um, but uh, I love that someone pointed that out. Now, what are we doing um, in Australia, and in particular in Swinburne, in fact, but, but Melbourne Uni is doing some great work with lensing as well. Uh, we are searching through enormous catalogs of uh, galaxies, survey instruments and asking the general public to classify. And in fact, this was a program called Spaceworks, but there's been a few others in which the public are trying to identify lenses. And you know, that's a lens, that's the major arc, that's a minor arc, that's obviously an Einstein ring. That could be the lens of a cluster of galaxies. You know. So asking them to classify and training the AI to learn from the humans and then go looking through the rest of the data about what it thinks a lens is. And for some reason, these are all the ones that um, it thought was a lens, which it wasn't, or some which were clearly lenses and it misidentified. So in other words, the AI is not perfect. But to me, the extraordinary thing is all of these look really weird and interesting and dodgy. And the challenge of an astronomer today is to sift through all of this data and to find these rare needles in a haystack events. These lenses are fascinating objects, incredibly rare, very hard to spot, because very rarely do you, do you get the data that I showed earlier, right? Like this is the reality of a lens, lens map. So it's a hard task, but we need to get better because the data that is coming down the pipeline is truly uh, terrifying in terms of its size. For example, the Dark Energy Survey has over 300 million sources of which 10 million potential candidates could be identified, but we know there's only 1,300 are real. That is an enormous amount to sift through for that very rare needle in a haystack. No human is doing that. It gets better slash worse, depending on if you're the grad student who's having to do this eye by eye checking, and that is because the um, Vera Rubin Observatory, the large-scale synoptic telescope, is finally coming online. It is an absolutely gorgeous instrument. It will find 18 billion sources, 350 million candidates, and 62,000 lenses. The, the era of humans doing this is over. It is now in the AI realm. And at Swinburne, uh, with, uh, under the leadership of Carl Glazebrook, 
uh, and, and in particular his postdoc, Colin Jacobs, they are training up AI, teaching the AI through uh, uh, known fake sources, essentially generated sources, um, to, to identify the lenses and to try to um, basically find these needles in billions of bits of hay. Now, the next, and, and sorry, by the way, I should point out that the, 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 what's so powerful about lensing is that it is responding to the matter. It doesn't matter if the matter that's doing the lensing, that's bending space-time, itself emits or absorbs light. That's, that's not a consideration for the lens. So in other words, the lensing effect will reveal the presence of even fundamentally invisible material. So you can map out clumps of dark matter, and in fact, you can map out um, lensing where there's just so few stars in that object and that galaxy is so pitifully small that it couldn't possibly be doing the lensing, except it's shrouded by this huge accumulation of otherwise invisible dark matter. So with the lens, we can both see the material dark matter, but we can also weigh it potentially as well. Now, it'd be remiss of me to um, uh, move on without just this extraordinary image from about a year ago, now, I think, but from the desk survey, and in particular, Australia's contribution, which is OSDES. And with this, um, the, uh, it's a slightly different lensing uh, techniques, known as weak lensing, but essentially we were able to create a map. This is obviously the Milky Way. This is peering off into the distance and looking at the slight optical illusions or the impact of, uh, in this case, countless millions of, of galaxies that lie along and form a structure known as the cosmic web, which we'll get into a bit later. But suffice to say that um, Australia is using lensing to map out the universe, whether that universe is visible or not. Because we're on the topic of lensing, there's a very exciting project that's underway right now. And I'm biased because it's, it's one I'm involved in. But we don't know what the dark matter is. But we know it is invisible, but that it has mass. What does that sound like? Really? Higgs boson? OK. Really? Black hole. Right? You say it, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the famously invisible thing, right? Definitely has matter, it has gravity, it has mass. So there's an idea that maybe the dark matter doesn't need to be a hypothetical new particle, but it can in fact be a black hole. And it wouldn't be this kind of a black hole, a you know, classic kind of stellar mass black hole, or the ones that we're seeing through, through LIGO, the gravitational wave um, detectors. These would be tiny, because obviously that would, that would reveal itself in other ways. But what if the black hole was formed not from the mass of something the size of a star, but something the size of, a, of an asteroid? Then it would be so tiny. In fact, it would be on the scale of an atom that the chances of anything, as it just trundles its way through space, ever getting near enough to fall into the black hole and reveal itself through the, the accretion disk, the glow of a feeding black hole, tiny, infinitesimally small. In other words, the dark matter could be a cloud of these fantastically tiny black holes. Now, this is an idea uh, popularized, in fact, by Stephen Hawking. And he was a smart guy, so maybe we should consider that. It has the advantage of knowing that black holes are real, too, by the way. So how would you detect a black hole? Hawking radiation, good. Yeah. They're too small, they evaporate, eventually they lose their mass, and the smaller they are, the faster they lose that mass, and they emit, they literally glow, and at the end of their lives, they explode in a flurry of energy as the last bits of matter are converted out into energy. And that's actually why we have Wi-Fi. CSR, we're going to look for the explosions in the radio in that instance of these primordial black holes. Cleaned up the signal with a um, Fourier transform technique that turns out many years later to be exactly the kind of thing you need to improve the Wi-Fi signal as it bounces around the room. And uh, the CSRO got uh, many, many millions of dollars in royalties on that. But no, not, <laughs> not Hawking radiation. These things are big enough that they've not evaporated. 
Because if they evaporated, then we wouldn't have the gravity of the dark matter. So they have to be just about big enough that they're not evaporating away. And in fact, the sweet spot, but not so big that we would have seen them already, or passing stars would have fallen into them or done something weird. So it's the mass, the sweet spot is about, is about a nano planet, a nano Earth. It's about the mass of it. But um, OK, well, I thought it would be a bit easier because I, I actually moved this segment earlier to the natural segue from lensing, thinking that was a natural uh, uh, connection point. Um, so yeah, lensing. <laughs> but basically, the idea, very similar, is the object passes between a telescope and a background star. You get that, uh, the, the lensing picture, the star would look, uh, essentially, you, you get a split image. Um, and critically, it's a magnifying glass as well, so you would get a brightening of the star. However, the black holes are so small that the lens that they produce, the lensed image, you can't see any of those effects. Is it an Einstein ring? Is it multiple images? Is it the Einstein cross? You, know, you don't get to see that. That's too, it's too small for our telescopes to resolve. Instead, all you get is the magnification of the brightening of the star. So in other words, you would look at a star, and then purely, purely by chance, a black hole, tiny black hole has moved between you and that star, and it has brightened, and it has faded away. So that's the idea. And that's what we're doing at Swinburne. This, and we have reason to think this isn't crazy, by the way, because a Nature article just a couple of uh, years ago, here is over time looking at a distant object. You can see the light, the intensity, the counts um, of that object normalized, and it brightens at a certain point and then fades away. This is an effect known as microlensing. And there's a, a couple of examples of, of um, what those images look like. So this brightening event was uh, very likely an, uh, a black hole of some mass, but critically too big a mass to be a, um, uh, a candidate for the dark matter. Or at least, if all the dark matter was that kind of a mass, we would have seen you know, dozens of such events in that observation time, not just the one that we did. So we can sort of rule it out. So we can look and say, what fraction of the dark matter is made up of, of these potential black holes as a function of the mass of the black hole. So in other words, uh, here's our very, very low mass gets ruled out by evaporation. They just evaporate by the present day. Very, very high masses. Uh, well, actually, they mess up the CMB. In the 90s, we did an experiment or program called MACHO where we were trying to look at this effect for stellar mass black holes or other degenerate uh, planetary, uh, plant degenerate systems, um, big clumps of stuff, and ruled that out. And now this work most recently ruled out a whole chunk. But I hope what you've noticed is that there's a little gap there that's not been ruled out. And that is where PhDs live. So, Rene Key is leading uh, the charge and um, supported by uh, Grace Lawrence, who does simulations of, of um, dark matter halos within our group. In work uh, with Ken Freeman of ANU, Jeremy Malt of Swinburne, uh, Ivo Labe of Swinburne, and uh, Abhi Saha over at, of, of NOAA over in the States. And what we were doing is looking for these potential primordial black holes. We are staring at the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's about a million stars. And we're taking pictures every 20 seconds. And what we hope to see is this, where you will get some star, and then, oh, it brightens, and then fades back down over the course of, in this instance, 15 minutes. And that allows us to estimate um, the potential mass of the primordial black hole. Now, that's tricky. Uh, and in fact, I was very fortunate just before COVID hit to get to um, DECAM in uh, Chile, and here it is, wonderful four meter. Um, and using that four meter pointing at the Large Magellanic Cloud with the extraordinary field of view of, of DECAM, uh, we took pictures of the sky every 20 seconds over five nights, and we've gone back and we've done this a few more times. And what we're looking for is a star to brighten and fade over the course of a few minutes. 
Now, I am a theorist by training. I'm a computational astrophysics by practice. What I'm not is in any way experienced with stellar astrophysics. And I, and I was shocked to discover that stars change. <laughs> and they change all the damn time. So their brightness is, is all over the shop. And it turns out if you're looking at a star every 20 seconds, everything is changing. So this work continues. Uh, Rene is getting very close, actually, though, to, to having the gold standard catalog of that, and we will be able to put um, at least constraints on uh, how much of the dark matter is made up by these primordial black holes. We're essentially about to close the final, final um, um, possibility, or alternatively demonstrate that it is, and, you know, Nobel Prizes. However, before the Nobel Prize, this will always be one of my real treasures from this, where I go to drink coffee uh, overlooking the Andes as the sun rose at the end of the shift. That was, that was great. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. I am so far behind time. Okay, so rotation curves. Everything else is a little shorter than this, so bear with me. Um, this is a classic indication that dark matter was there. Uh, Ostensibly, Fritz Wicke in the 30s noted that clusters of galaxies were whizzing around too fast for the material that they could see to hold on to it. He postulated there must be Donka Materi, a Swiss, uh, a Swiss astronomer, which is a dark, dark material. Um, Vera Rubin did the same or a similar kind of experiment uh, for galaxies, or at least didn't, didn't intend to discover this, I should point out. She wanted to measure the speed of a rotating in doing so, well, to weigh it. So the experiment goes a little like this. We have a um, something on the end of a string. Thanks, Lee, for the demo on this. So if you are rotating around an object on the end of the string, you can feel that there's a certain amount of force required to hold on to it. If I, don't, if I don't apply that force with my hand, it flies off. So something going around, there must be a force acting, obviously via the string, but acting nonetheless to hold on to it. Now, the faster that's going, the more force is required to hold on to it. I can assure you of that. This is beginning to uh, interesting stringly. It's really burning. <laughs> um, told me it was frictionless. That was a total lie. Um, so the faster the rotation, the greater the force that's holding onto it. So we go back to the gently rotating version. And now the longer the rotation uh, radial length, you can even hear it now, the greater the force. And if that goes fast and it's long as well, then even greater. And if there's no force or not enough force, off it goes. So. If you don't have enough force to hold on to fast moving objects, particularly at greater distances, they'll fly away. Now in space, there's no strings, of course. What there is as a force is gravity. So by measuring the speed of the rotation at different points ever further out from the center, Vera could measure the amount of gravity that was holding on to those stars that were visibly moving around and infer how much mass must be inside. Everyone's okay with that? It's, it's beautifully elegant. Such a fascinating, such, such a, a exquisitely insightful way to, to um, use basic physics. Now, so in other words, take a measurement of the velocity, the speed, as a function of the distance or the radius from the center. I'm sure you've all seen this plot. What she thought was something that would drop as the force of gravity weakened because you were getting very further out. And obviously, all of the objects that were moving too fast would have flown away. They just wouldn't be there because gravity gets weaker the further out you are from the, system, from the mass. And what she measured was instead something that was rising. And this is insane. This is absolutely extraordinary. The fact that, in fact, the, out, the outer edge is moving even faster. So the material going around at the outer edges is moving faster than the material 
close into where all the visible mass and hence gravity is, is absolutely counterintuitive. It means there's enormous amounts of extra gravity holding onto those fast moving outer objects. Vastly more gravity than can be explained by the gravity of the visible component. So there must be a huge amount of invisible material providing that gravitational force. We can talk about Mon later, but this is, this is um, one of the, the, the classic indications that the that dark matter is real and in fact has an extended halo. So it extends out to large radii to, to provide that, distance, uh, the, that force at such great distances. Now, Australia is doing this measurement uh, in, in incredibly precise ways. Um, Angel of a beautiful video, time lapse above, in this case, the, um, the UK Schmidt telescope. And with these telescopes in Australia, uh, we are looking out at galaxies and measuring their rotation. But now, rather than just a few points, try to get that measurement um, and indeed combining optical imagery uh, like uh, with, with AAOs, with new generation radio telescopes that map not the stars, but the gas swirling around, moving around in those galaxies with, for example, Australian SK Pathfinder and WA, which is in fact the telescope I came out um, over a decade ago to, to, to Australia to work on. We can create maps like this, where this is a galaxy now we are seeing its um, velocity. We can actually move, uh, measure through the Doppler effect um, the velocity of the um, galaxy, and we can break it down into the bulk motions or orders or moments of motion. But essentially, in this um, example, we can see that we have a blue shift, so material moving toward. Oh, so the Doppler shift, sorry, very, very quickly. Um, familiar to us all with ambulances where the pitch is higher of an ambulance moving towards you as the sound waves are compressed. And then as it moves by, it's stretched out and the wavelength is increased, the pitch drops. Visibly, that would be the light waves are compressed. So we're seeing a blue, so shorter wavelengths, blue. And then as we move away, we get an extension um, of the wavelength, increase the wavelength so it becomes redder. So blue means it's an object is moving towards you, red means it's moving away if it's purely through the velocity of the Doppler effect. So in this instance, we are seeing um, the blue side moving towards, the red side moving away, so it's spinning around. But now it's not just one measurement point, one measurement point, right? I mean, we have the actual motion of an entire galaxy mapped out. Just find this extraordinary, this has been done for, for hundreds of galaxies now. And in fact, you can then go, OK, well, that's the rotation. Let's take the rotation out and see what's left. And we have this, where now this is the, um, so this is an H alpha map, so this is essentially ionized gas. So we're now seeing the sloshing around of, of the gas within the galaxy as the galaxy is rotating, right? So extraordinary amounts of information, exquisite measurements by AO in this instance. Um, so we can see that gas moves around at about 10, 10 to 20 kilometers per second. Put that all together, and what you can do is create velocity curves that look like this, where we can break down the different components. There's neutral hydrogen, detected by something like an ASCAP. There's molecular hydrogen that forms the stars. You get a little bit more of it in the centers, where it's nice and dense. Not much of it, though. Most of it's in the stars. So this is the amount of the velocity um, that can be attributed to each component. And there, since that's the total, we can subtract the stars and all the gases providing and what's left must be the dark matter. And you can see you have this beautiful, smooth, rising curve. And it's as simple as that. Oh, yeah. But it's not perfect. So galaxies are a little weird and have little kinks in them. Now, how am I doing for time? I have no idea. I haven't got a clock. You good. good? All right. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me the number. Just I'm good. All right. So. How are we doing? We're feeling all right. So now we're measuring from individual galaxies the lensing signatures to detect where this invisible material is. The rotation curves allow us to weigh through the uh, uh, impact of gravity exactly how much dark matter there is, indeed, even in its extended structures. Um, if we zoom out, we actually have one of the most profound 
proofs of, of dark matter. And that is so-called large-scale structure is what I did my thesis on. If you start a simulation now not of a galaxy, but zoomed out, uh, in this instance, several hundred million light years across, just after the uh, Big Bang, it starts off smooth, but then slowly over time, the gravity of this instance, the dark matter, takes over, and we see that same effect. This is the very first video, which clumps are forming. But now, slowly over time, these clumps um, begin to demonstrate a really interesting filamentary or tendril-like structure. Each of these clumps would contain something about the size of the Milky Way. So this is a very big universe. And slowly, over the course of time to the present day, we see these voids open up where material is emptying out of and being pulled into the denser regions which form these filaments, and along which these filaments you have accumulations or halos, which are the galaxies, and the galaxies are like morning dew along a spider's web in your backyard. So this is called the cosmic web. And this is where you can see I didn't have a big enough supercomputer to simulate more of the universe. There's literally the edge, which would not be what you would see in real life. So you can go out into the universe, as was done, with the 2DF, another Australian telescopic survey. And you can note the positions of galaxies as you look from the center, i.e. Earth, going outwards in little angular cones onto the night sky, little slivers. And every time you see a galaxy, you just note its position, distance from you, position on the sky. Right? And what you see are not a random or smooth distribution, but rather you see the galaxies forming along these exact filamentary structures, the simulations revealed. So here they are. We get these nice tendrils or filaments, the cosmic web. What's interesting about this plot is that half of it is simulated, is a fake. So with a show of hands, who thinks the fake is blue and red is the real universe seen by the 2DF? Who thinks the red is the fake and the blue is the... Okay, a few, and who doesn't know? <laughs> Good. You see, I very rarely, most people always choose one or the other, which is, unless you've seen the plot, is statistically a crazy thing to do, because statistically they are absolutely indistinguishable. So the people who couldn't tell the difference were exactly correct. So this is... Uh, one of the triumphs of these large-scale simulations. Just putting in the material, the amount of dark matter, and some of the basic physics to, to make galaxies, plus the gravity, of course, you could recreate at large scales the universe as we see to an indistinguishable level. Dark matter is the key. For those of you who were wanting to know, however, blue is real and red was the fake. So, I don't know if that matters to anyone, but... Um, the, uh, how you can tell is um, you can get you can see these little stripes. These are known as fingers of God because they point back, seemingly point back to us, and that's the motion inside a cluster of galaxies where they're whizzing around, and you only pick up the velocity that's in your line of sight in your direction. That was All right, so good. Um, now we are advancing again in Australia with this uh, large-scale mapping technique and the uh, largest telescope that will ever be constructed, I I'm very confident to say that, is uh, the Square Kilometre Array, which is going into the Murchison Radio Observatory in WA in the Murchison Shire. Um, it's a relatively old image now, but anyways, here we see uh, ASCAP, the Pathfinder, and um, uh, with 36 dishes, um, the SKA will have smaller dishes, but will essentially they're known as dipoles, but there'll be hundreds of thousands of them spread out across the desert. And with that, you can map essentially almost all of the neutral hydrogen in the universe out to, um, well, at, at least where the Hubble image took us. Perhaps it's actually going to go uh, quite a bit further. But even ASCAP is a profoundly powerful tool. And in this visualization, I created a universe and looked at it with ASCAP eyes. Um, and here is the prediction where you can see this 
filamentary structure for the a survey known as Wallaby, where we're going to just try to find loaded galaxies. Um, close to us, further away from us, and you can see that we're a southern hemisphere telescope because as we rotate around, the northern hemisphere is invisible. We can't see galaxies looking through the Earth. And that was remarkably ambitiously precise, 620,123 galaxies. So I can't believe I'm still in astronomy, quite frankly, that, that the telescope has now finished. That survey is about to finish, and I'll be shown to be wrong, I suspect, about that precision. Um, but the key is that you can make that level of prediction and have it directly tested through observation. And by the way, the SK will find a billion galaxies. So that's going to be quite, quite a profound tool. All right, now, so far I've spoken about somewhat, uh, you know, we'll call them clues. So we know how much dark matter there is, we know where it is, but we still don't know what it is. And in fact, we can change the properties in the simulation, uh, giving the dark matter slightly different characteristics. There's cold dark matter, there's warm, hot dark matter, and see the visible, uh, the, sorry, see its impact on the formation of the visible structure. So in other words, we can rerun the simulation with different properties for dark matter and see does it impact the visible stuff that we can see. So in that way, rule out more extreme candidates of the dark matter, which has been very successful. But now we're getting to a very interesting stage of the talk because now we're really trying to go to answer what is the dark matter. And there is one idea that the dark matter could be its own uh, antiparticle. And in which case, the amount of, or the signal would be, two dark matter particles would come colliding together. They would annihilate their, their own antiparticle. And in doing so, e equals mc squared, all that mass would turn into energy, and it would be quite a lot of energy, and it would be seen as incredibly energetic light. It would be seen as gamma rays, the most energetic form of light. <clears throat> and um, the, the amount of that would scale like the density squared, essentially the chance that two dark matter particles come together, density times density gives you density squared. So that uh, expectation, at least, for that kind of dark matter means that wherever there's a lot of dark matter accumulating, there could be a glow of gamma radiation. What would that look like? Well, we can take a simulation of a Milky Way sized mass um, halo. In this case, this is run by Volker Springle. It's good known as the Aquarius simulation. We see just the insane complexity of the dark matter structures within structures, and indeed, you know, you have halos and subhalos and sub subhalos, and you know, it's sort of Russian doll all the way down. And each of those clumps, in theory, should have colliding dark matter or self annihilating dark matter and could be glowing in gamma rays. Now, if you're sitting on the Earth looking back towards the center of the galaxy, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this, where you would see a central, sort of very ISRN esque, but a very um, structural peak in the density of the dark matter at, the, at essentially the bottom of the potential gravitational well of the galaxy, where it's all going to pull. The density is enhanced. You'll see more colliding um, or self annihilating dark matter signatures. You'll see more gamma radiation. So uh, we look out at the night sky in the, uh, with a Fermi telescope, gamma ray telescope, and we see this, which I hope you can appreciate. It's not the best connection between theory and observation I've ever seen. It's just one of the awkward facts that, at least for a dark matter theorist or physicist like myself, that, that the, the galaxy does tend to complicate things enormously. And the baryonic sector, you and I and stars, does make things a little harder to see the purity of the dark matter signal. But you can... So by the way, these are exploding uh, stars, the supernovae remnants, the hot energetic uh, outburst of, a, of an exploding star. Um, these are feeding black holes, these are quasars. Right? So we can actually begin to identify and strip out all of those known sources. And when you do that, you're left with an excess, a bit you can't explain, right at the center. And that got everyone excited. Um, and was this the long-awaited dark matter signature? No, no. It turns out that it was, in fact, another culprit, um, an extraordinarily interesting object, um, but not 
to my eyes, quite as interesting as dark matter. Uh, and that is a, oh, does anyone know what that is? Black hole, yeah, I heard black hole. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. I'm conscious. Claire, no? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. It's like astronomy. I don't know. It's an unusual image. I will say that. It's not fair of what I've picked, but. All oh, right, everyone. Um, it's a pulsar. So this is a. Um, uh, well, in fact, this is the Vela pulsar, but. Um, it is a, a compact object that's emitting beams of uh, radiation. We typically talk about the radio emission from a pulsar as it pulses around, it sweeps around, but it's, it's emitting incredibly energetically, including gamma rays. And the countless numbers of pulsars that are sitting in the galaxy, we can't directly see, but their gamma rays are leaking out and doing all sorts of funky things. Positrons are getting emitted, everything's getting emitted. For sure, that's, um, that actually ends up explaining. Or at least we can't reasonably rule out that to then claim a more extraordinary conclusion of the dark matter. Um, and in fact, had a, a journal been nicer, um, well, OK, I'm, I'm embargoed from saying any more about that, but watch, watch this space. But yes, it gets harder. It turns out to find self-annihilating dark matter. Which actually leaves us with only one other option now. And that is to find the dark matter ourselves, here, here on Earth, here in the lab. So we've been going now for something like uh, 45 minutes. Maybe, maybe we are clocking up to an hour. There's about 100 people here. That means, um, on average, by now, one of you must have statistically had a dark matter particle collide with your body, send an atom of your body recoiling away, very likely out of your body. But if you've had bickies beforehand, you've, you've just ingested a trillion trillion atoms, so you're fine. So you can lose one, that's okay. Now, I very much suspect none of you have noticed that atom recoiling out of your body, and that is because we make for very poor dark matter detectors. But we are building a better one here in Victoria, and we are building it based around this, which is a... Uh, uh, does anyone know what this is? Yeah? Yeah, it's a crystal, yeah, very good. It's a, in fact, it's, it's, it's a sodium ionide crystal. It's not, not worlds apart from the type of um, uh, salt you might have in your chips. That's sodium chloride, that's sodium iodide. But the idea is it's an ultra-pure crystal that, when struck by anything, flashes, emits a little bit of light. And this is uh, purified to an extraordinary uh, level in, in a technique um, first pioneered by, um, in Princeton, within our collaboration. And we place these crystals with PMTs or photomultiplier tubes or just very sensitive cameras, either end. We wrap the whole thing in ultra pure copper. And then if anything strikes that crystal, it's going to glow. And those cameras will, will detect that little flash of light. So we know it's been struck by something. Those uh, copper enclosed crystals are suspended in a larger structure. And that's because the, the crystals will, um, we, uh, I mentioned we make them pure. And the purity is quite extraordinary. The, the amount of impurity of potential radioactive material um, is sitting at about one part in a trillion. And I can never figure out how to make that number in any way relatable. It's like, it's like you being able to identify every single person on Earth individually um, spotting like the odd man out, but doing that for a thousand Earths. I mean, how does that help? As a, you know, but that's the level of, of precision with which we can both make, but also measure the impurities. So that ultra pure crystal no radioactive material within it. 
And that's important because these crystals will, will glow and stop by dark matter. They'll glow and stop by anything, just normal radiation. And in fact, we have to make them out of ultra-pure materials because otherwise they'll be blinded by their own inherent radiation. And the worst of it is something called potassium-40, which is what you get in bananas. So if you eat a banana and walk by this detector, it, you'll blind the detector. Right? It will see you coming. So we have to go to extraordinary lengths of precision of the material we select to make the detector out of, a detector called Sabre. But that's not enough. Even those extraordinary lengths, we, you, you can't rule out naturally occurring radiation. But what you can do is place the crystals within another detector. So now these crystals with their cameras enclosed in copper are suspended in a liquid scintillator now, so something that glows when struck, watched by its own set of cameras. This is a, about 10 tons now. This, is, this thing's a few meters high. It's sitting in my one turner lab. In fact, oh, here it is. There it is. It was a getting, flatbed truck getting installed. So why we do this, and this is an idea of Frank Price in Princeton, really wonderful concept called active veto, is dark matter is, is a good, it will travel through without collision. I, I mentioned, you know, one of us may have first got hit. What I didn't mention was, you know, essentially every second, a few billion particles are flying through your body each and every second. And maybe, you know, one in, you know, whatever numbers of trillions will collide. It's very much like a ghost. You can't see it. It goes through solid walls. The earth goes like it. But let's say a particle of dark matter does hit and it causes a flash of light. Well, you can look around in the liquid around it and ask, well, did you see a flash of light? Because the dark matter should be able to slip through. The chances that it hits once and then again, nah, not in this universe, literally in the lifetime of the universe. But if it's raining, something in the material snuck through. Flash, as the radiation hits, and then it comes out into the liquid and flash again, because it hits in here. So two flashes, must be some background. Just one flash of the crystal could be dark matter. One flash could just come from here, but how could you tell? Right? If anyone's asking, think about that. So that's the concept. So this is the vessel. Um, it's currently being uh, finished the fit out in, in, um, uh, in Monterna, the Hawthorne campus in Monterna. And it will be installed in um, a site here in Victoria very soon. The important point to note is that this is going here as a very special property of the dark matter signal. So just an, I'm nearly done, but I'll just spend another minute or two on this. And that is the wind. So we have a cloud of dark matter that our galaxy is traveling, is, it lies within, and as it goes around, and our sun indeed, and one of the spiral arms goes around in an orbit that takes 250 million years. We are traveling through that cloud of dark matter. And just like in the stillest of days in, um, uh, on Earth, the air isn't moving, not visible, not, not a bulk motion, there's no wind. But if you drive through it and you put your, car, your hand out the car window, you will feel a force of wind against you. That's the headwind, right? That's you going through it. In the same way, our sun is going through that cloud. So we have a headwind of the dark matter rushing. But we're not on our sun. We're on the Earth. What a revelation as an astronomy talk to give you all. Which means for half of the year, we are traveling in the same direction as the sun is going around Milky Way. So the wind blows harder. And for half the year, we're going in the other direction. So the wind blows less. So more events, more wind, more collisions, less, more, less, more, varying over the course of a year the annual modulation. Everyone's okay with that? Yeah. And why I point this out is we have a, uh, we know where the, the sun is traveling, it's in the constellation Cygnus. That's actually why I know how many particles are traveling through you, because I know how fast our sun, solar system, is moving through that cloud. So for half of the year, we're, we're in a line. And in fact, maximally, we're pointing most in that direction 
at the calendar month of June. So the wind blows fastest, hardest in June, so more collisions in June, less least collisions, in fact, in December. And this is very useful as a signal because it's very hard to tell the difference, quite frankly, about a claim of dark matter um, versus anything else that changes over the course of a year. Because a group, an Italian group, Sabre, uh, 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 Dama Libra, um, has claimed such a signal. They've seen the up increase in June, de minimum in December, and that nice, for nearly 10 years now, variation. But no one else can find, can replicate that experiment. No one else has used exactly the same material as them, at least until us. So Sabre, albeit with slightly improved crystals, but the same target, sodium iodide, we are going to test them directly, exactly, but there's no point doing it in the Northern Hemisphere in Italy where they're based, because what else changes through the course of the year? Solar radiation, yeah, okay. I love how much people overthink this one. Yeah, seasons, yeah, perfect, absolutely. The seasons change. So maybe it's not that it's peaking in June, maybe it's peaking in summer in Italy. And as a, de as a minimum, winter in Italy. How's the easiest way to determine that difference? Yeah, go to the south. So that's, that's where we are, just helpfully indicating, right? And they're up there. So in other words, when we do this experiment, and if we see an increase in the signal in the month of June and the minimum in the month of December, just like Italy, the dark matter has swept through the Earth, an increased signal, the wind has picked up at the same time because of our, our, our motion of the Earth around the Sun. We should see the same increase as them and the same decrease as them, same months. But if instead it's something else to do with the seasons, the background, then peak in our summer, which is of course there in opposite effect. It's the cleanest, most simplest way to disentangle those effects. Um, we are going to the Stahl Underground, uh, st sorry, to the, the town of Stahl in the Stahl Underground Physics Laboratory. That's, that's what the mine looks like, the gold mine. Um, it's an active gold mine, um, and it's a project led by Professor Elisabetta Barberio of uh, Melbourne University. This was it a few months back when I went. You go down a tunnel, 30, meter, uh, 30 minute drive down a tunnel, nine kilometers winding slowly in the dark until you get to a kilometer underground, and there we have built this cathedral-esque cavern within, and now the fit-out is occurring, and it looks like a lab, but just not quite like any lab you've ever been in before. And we've gone to this extraordinary length because it's, as I mentioned, the, the detectors will glow when struck by anything, including radiation from uh, exploding stars, those gamma ray um, you know, maps I was showing with other particles emitted, so exploding stars, feeding black holes, they produce something called cosmic rays. Indeed, even radiation from the sun itself. So we have to go down a kilometer underground to allow the rock, a kilometer's worth of rock, to try to stop all of that radiation from blinding our detector. And what that means when we install Sabre in these coming months, and then get away from it and not allow bananas anywhere near it, is that we will be waiting for a crystal sitting within a 10-ton fluid detector, sitting a kilometer underground to shield it from radiation from space, waiting for the faintest of glows to be recorded as this dark matter particle purely by chance has swept through the Earth and has collided with our crystal to reveal the presence of this ghost. And that is why I do physics. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I think we might see if we've got some questions. Might turn some lights on quickly. 
we go. Who had their hand up? Um, uh, just wanted to ask your views on the fact that the LHC didn't show up any dark matter, and particularly mm. the supersymmetric yeah. candidates. Okay, so, so the dark matter center of excellence, um, mm -hmm. aka the ARC center of excellence for dark matter particle physics, but we call it the dark matter center for obvious reasons. Um, also led by Professor Elizabeth Barbario, has a few different programs of work. One of them is direct detection, so this saber. One of them is theory, uh, slash astronomy, the stuff that I'm going to show you. One of them is metrology, the measurement of impurities, and the fourth is LHC. So we're waiting for the dark matter to reveal itself either through astronomical means, as I mentioned, or through the detection of the collision with the experiment. But we could, of course, just produce it ourselves. And that's the concept in the LHC in which you have high energy collisions equals mc squared. So that energy of the collision is converted into mass and potentially new kinds of particles. And what if dark matter were produced in such a collision? Well, it would well, essentially, in, upon production, would just fly out of the detector and never trigger anything. It's a ghost, after all. So knowing the energy that went in and adding up all the energy of everything you can see coming out, they won't match. And they won't match by about the mass of the dark matter particle. The problem is we're not seeing anything like that. So what that means is that the simplest so-called minimally symmetric SUSY models um, uh, are ruled out because we're not seeing that. But particle physicists are nothing if not fantastically intelligent people and can always come up with a new theory to fit that lack of observation, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a moving target. Um, we should have seen, dark matter should be produced, by the way, already in the LHC clear, easily high enough energies um, for, for some of those cases. Uh, so I think it's, I think it's actually one of the more powerful ways to do the experiment of finding dark matter is combining um, those null detections, null productions in LHC, because that constrains a lot of the interesting bits of particle physics around a candidate dark matter, and then combining with all the other stuff that we're seeing. And when you bring everything together, you really start to make life very difficult for the dark matter uh, uh, candidates. So even the null detections are proving fantastically useful. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly upsetting some theorists who, well, should have got a Nobel Prize, should have, would have got a Nobel Prize by now, right, if they'd been right, if it'd been detected. But um, the energy's getting ramped up again. We'll go back, find, you know, put some new limits. I don't think anyone's overly hopeful of finding it that way. But you've got to look. You never know. Any other questions? Oh, there's actually one at the front. Oh, there was one at the front. Yeah. I was going to ask if the... Sabre like data match the one in Italy, I believe. Mm -hmm. yep. Would that then like prove the existence of dark matter and prove your theories, or would you need to do more follow-up research? Well, the, the answer any scientist gives is always we need to do more uh, research, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Though, so what we would have shown if we're seeing the same, if the signal increases in the month because of the motion of the Earth and not the seasons. Um, all we've shown is that what's doing it is outside of the solar system. And it's, you know, yeah, it's probably dark matter at that point, and we certainly would make that claim. It takes us about three years, by the way, of, of, of measurements to confirm either way. Um, so we'll know in three years uh, if, if DAM is, you know, uh, ruled in or out, three to five years. Uh, at that point, let's say we do detect it, and we are, and they are right, and they're vindicated, um, probably Nobel Prize is going to them. However, that's where it starts, not where it stops. So then you build detectors that are specifically designed to detect that weird kind of dark matter that will interact with the sodium iodide crystals, but not the 100 ton xenon detectors that have been looking as well in Germany and other kinds. There's the global hunt, many, many detectors. Um, so it just means the dark matter is super weird, that it somehow has a preference, predilection for interacting with certain types of atoms and not others. Um, that it's spin independent, uh, spin dependent, not spin independent. I mean, there's, you know, it gets very, very interesting. So, so in other words, once you detect it and confirm it's a particle of a, an approximate mass and collision cross section, then you then you go really hard on it to figure out exactly all of its properties. And in particular, you ask, is there just one particle, or is there many? Because if you look 
you know, we are, as I say, just a fifth of the mass of the universe, all the rest is in dark matter. And <laughs> look how complex the, atom, the, the periodic table is. So why should something that's five times more be only one constituent? Why shouldn't it be as, as equally complex? There's some reasons to suggest that it should be simple, but that's just Occam's razor fundamentally. You, you don't invent a whole peri dark matter periodic table when you haven't found one. But the moment you've found the one, everyone's going to start to look for the complexity and, and try to branch out. Um, but yeah, basically three years from now, you, you'll know, and you'll know if there's a career to go into in exploring those candidates. I prefer to move it through this mask, by the way. Oh, but, my God. But anyway, there we go. Yep. Uh, Professor Duffy, thank you very much for coming along tonight and giving us such an uh, entertaining talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit of a dark matter skeptic. I, I sure. have to... Uh, I have to um, acknowledge that, but I, but I'm just wondering how many of the nano-sized Earth uh, mini black holes would we expect to find in this uh, room tonight? Oh, in the room! Oh my yeah. God, none. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. You would know. My goodness, you would know about it. Um, so the, um, uh, so you have about um, ten. Uh, so you have about a trillion solar masses worth of dark matter in our Milky Way. Seems like a lot. Uh, but you say, okay, well, how many, um, you know, nano Earths is that? And it's about, um, it'd be something like 10 to the 40. <laughs> I should have done this calculation. Well, about 10 to the 40 of them, give or take, probably some orders of magnitude off. Seems like a lot. Then you ask, how big is it, right? And space, again, to an astronomy crowd, but space is really big. And in particular, um, so this dark matter is quite well spread out. Um, you might have it by chance passing the solar system. And you might see a perturbation on an orbit once, and then it's gone. So, how, but how you would see it is in the motion of the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud objects at the very distant right. And in fact, in fact, um, Lisa I think, wrote a story about how basically dark matter flybys might have triggered an infall of an Oort cloud comet that hit the asteroid. Oh, that's great. I don't know how you can't prove that. But it's, what a story. Um, so yeah, so, so look, I think that the, the key is that we will be putting the most stringent up limits, and by the time LSST is fully ramped up, it will wipe out the rest of the little sliver of, of space for that, that candidate. Um, and then that just means it's not a black hole. Um, look, I think, I think the point is that the, the dark matter is, is there, uh, by which I mean um, there's you know, five times more of it than everything we can see, uh, that it is effectively collisionless to an extraordinary degree, and you have a bullet cluster where the things smash together and the dark matter just flew by through itself. So it doesn't interact with itself or normal material to any appreciable amount. We hope it interacts a little bit because otherwise we can't see it at all the detectors. But that's, a, but that's a very large parameter space to search within about masses and candidates. So it could be that nature is kind and we'll find it within the next 10 years. Nature doesn't have to be kind to us. It could just be more ghost-like uh, than, than we might have hoped. And let's remember that the gravitational wave discovery it was a century. We've only been doing this for about 50 years. So, you know, by my 80s, I should be due the discovery someone will have made, hopefully, right? Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Yep. Um, why do you think uh, dark matter self-annihilates? Oh, why do I think it self-annihilates? Well, actually, I mean, I don't. Um, it, uh, uh, it, but it's certainly worth checking, right? So, the idea is... Uh, because we have antiparticles, and, and that is just a very generic expectation from particle physics, it's entirely feasible, reasonable, in fact, that dark matter will have an antiparticle and that could be itself. Um, the, and in fact, there are very specific proposed models for the dark matter that it must be. So you can rule them out directly through these kinds of observations. So what we're doing is how um, in the same way that it is, you know, uh, it has essentially 
little to no, well, hopefully not no, but little interaction with the visible side of the universe, the baryons that we are made of, um, that it can also be very ghost-like even to itself. So it could be its own antiparticle, but again, the cross-section, the chance that it hits is just so tiny that it never annihilates. But it's more a case of this is such a, um, a powerful, profoundly powerful technique where you would look into the night sky with a gamma ray telescope and there is a consistent glow from a direction and then you put you know the Keck telescope say you know in swim room we're doing this sometimes and you can't make or maybe you see like one or two stars or half a dozen stars they're clearly not producing the gamma rays so maybe that's that would be one of those kinds of signatures but um, it, it's just a case of it being such a um, smoking gun signal. There's very few other ways that the dark matter could reveal itself to astronomy now in, t in terms of its exact nature because the gamma ray emission would be at exactly two times the, two times the mass of the dark matter to, yeah. Dark matter mass, dark matter mass lies into gamma radiation. Uh, actually, no, no, it'd have to be half. Anyways, whatever, because you'd admit two. So, but you would get some multiple of the actual mass, so you get a spectral line. So just like we get spectral line observations of, from the sun, everything else, you would get an emission line in gamma rays. And in fact, why we got so excited about the, the, the gamma ray emission from the center of the galaxy was because it was 511. Right? Someone's like, ooh, look at that, you know, so 511 keV. Um, turns out, I mean, that's just electron positron, so. Um, but fortunately, at this point, there's no unambiguous signal of gamma ray emission. It's just, seems very reasonable that it should be its own antiparticle, but it doesn't have to be. So no one, you know, doesn't, it rules out those candidates that suggest that it is. But again, particle physicists, very clever. They'll always come up with new models that make you, that dance around the data. Thanks. I'm very conscious that Claire's on stage. <laughs> so I think I've got that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight. On behalf so of the ASV, I just want to say thanks for coming. And thank you so much for having me. The thanks for having me. And we now have a What's in the Sky for June from Claire. I did say it right. She thought I was going to say it wrong. Have you got your mic ready to go? Just got to turn it on. I'll go and turn the lights off for you. How's that? Oh, what? Lights off? Oh, why are we back there? Oh, we've skipped ahead. I think everyone's, yeah, okay. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so today I thought I'd, um, thank you, Alan, that was amazing. Just fantastic. Uh, this is going to be a little bit less cerebral, I hope. Um, I know I'm going to sleep really well tonight uh, while those pieces of dark matter are flowing through me. Um, but yeah, basically, I'm just going to talk to you about what you might want to have a look at for June. A lot of you will be, I'm going to take this off here and put it there. Um, so there we go, sorry. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about is what you might want to look up at and look at in the sky for June. I've got some specific things for you to look out for and I've got some general things that you might want to point your telescope at or even just your eyeballs. So I'm a communicator, a science communicator and astrophysicist. I'm currently doing a little bit of work, of work at the University of Melbourne, uh, but sort of looking to spread my wings a little bit. And uh, yeah, I really love coming to talk to you about what's in the sky. Um, first of all, I thought I'd start with something really, really obvious. Once you know it's there, it's pretty obvious because it flies past pretty quickly. Most people would know the International Space Station. Uh, you may as well look at it now because you've only got 10 years or so before it's gone. So get out there and have a look. You can actually see it with your eyes. It's a bright dot and it moves quite quickly. Peak viewing times this month include this Friday, if you're an early riser at 5.47. Hands up, who's getting up to see that? Oh, we've got one, that's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I actually have to get up on Saturday mornings and uh, about that time and it is a struggle. Don't get astrophysicists to get up in the morning. We are night people most of the time, unless we're radio and we don't really talk to them. Um, so, what you need to do... What's that? <laughs> no, you're okay. What you need to do, obviously, is wake up. Or if you're still awake, then stay awake. Uh, at 5.47, you need to have a look at, in the north-northwest. It will actually appear there about halfway up give or take, and you haven't got that long, you've got about uh, three minutes, 
and it will disappear 10 degrees above northeast. So it's there and then it's gone. It's really obvious if you know what you're looking for. You get another chance if you weren't so good at finding that one. You can have a look on Sunday, June 19. So another week ahead. This one's in the evening, so just after sunset. This will be in the northwest, so it will actually be a little bit impacted probably by the light in the sky, but you can probably still see it. That will actually be up for five minutes. So this will go 10 degrees above the northwest, and then it will go all the way across. It's actually going to get about uh, 50 odd degrees up in the sky, so it's going to be about halfway. So you should see this one quite well. Uh, don't worry, I'll give you a summary thing at the end. It's a big thing. You can, you can totally go and look this up. Uh, and then it will disappear in the east-southeast. And then if you miss that one, uh, you've got another go. Uh, on the next two days later, pretty much the same time, uh, west-northwest and disappearing above the south-southeast. What's really, really interesting about the ISS, has anybody noticed something about these times? It's quite interesting. Hmm. Is one of them midnight? No, so, so what are they? That's right. Does anybody know why that is? Absolutely. It doesn't produce its own light. So it's actually best seen when there's a bit of sun left, at least just below the horizon, to actually come up and reflect on it so that we can see it. So it's not really magic. That's the reason. <laughs> There we go. And interestingly enough, the ISS does actually fly over our heads, but when you're actually above 51.6 uh, degrees latitude on Earth, you actually don't get it flying overhead because the ISS never actually goes up to that latitude, which is kind of interesting as well. You didn't know you were going to get ISS facts tonight, did you? <laughs> so what does this mean? Well, um, what can you expect to see? Well, I thought I'd, I thought I'd talk to you about um, how, big, how big is 10 degrees. Does anybody know a rough handy hint of how to find out what 10 degrees might be when you're sitting out there and looking at the sky. Yeah, you've got your hands out. I love it. Right, I gave it away with a handy hint. Yeah, a fist. So, so look, I have actually got tiny hands. I used to be a netball coach and I was coaching some grade twos one day and they said, Miss, how do you even catch the ball? Um, and I just went, you'll catch this. Uh, so no, I didn't. I, no, I'm always loving. And but yes, I have tiny hands, so obviously there's going to be a little bit of variation. But the general rule of thumb of these handy hints, guys, is that at arm's length, we're going to assume there's some sort of ratio between uh, your length of your arm and the size of your fist. At arm's length, from here to here, it's about 10 degrees. So if you want to go 10 degrees up from the horizon, stick that on the horizon. But be mindful, you probably can't see exactly zero. So that's 10 degrees. 25, 15, I don't have, I have a lot of spread that way, but not a lot there, so it's probably not quite exactly right. 10, 5, <laughs> and 1. So it's all held out at arm's length. So this is a little handy hint. Well, as we go through tonight, if I say, oh, it's 10 degrees this, it's 5 degrees there, it's 54, you can sit there and be like, 10, 20, 30, 40. So that's pretty easy, right? And you'll be so smart, people will be like, how do you know what that is? You'll be like, oh, Got some tips. So I thought I'd start with the thing that's next closest to the Earth. I thought I'd start with the Moon. Now most people go, oh the Moon's boring, it's there all the time, there's nothing to see. There's a lot to see on the Moon if you, if you are inclined and if you know where to look. First of all, we've got the uh, Moon at first quarter. It's actually tonight. So when you go out there, you should see the Moon in this beautiful half. Wait, didn't I just say quarter? But that's a half. You're laughing at me. You're like, oh my god, astrophysicist doesn't even know how the moon works. Of course, the quarter refers to the cycle, right? So we go from new all the way through to full, and the quarter, of course, that is the quarter of the phase. So that's the quarter phase moon. Then we've got waxing gibbous at some stage in between the full moon on the 15th of June. Now on the full moon here, I would actually suggest that that is a much better time to view the moon than that one if you value your eyeballs like I do. If you don't have a, a moon lens particularly, but you know, I even find when I'm using moon lenses, I, I come away and I'm just like, it's not good. Okay, so I typically think that it's better to have a look at the moon when it's in its its quarter or its crescent phase, or sometimes even its gibbous phase. This is also, does anybody know what that black line there is called? You would all know. Terminus. That's where you get on the train. No, uh, so that's the terminus there. That's where the light terminates. 
That is one of the best places to put your telescope and have a look along there. If you're really careful, you can actually have a look at some of the shadows that go into these craters from these, from these huge mountains. And it's actually really ghostly. So if you haven't looked in the moon in a while, I really, really, really encourage you to do so. So I've put some strawberries on this full moon. So in a week, we'll be having the strawberry moon. But of course, that doesn't really relate to us. So you know all those almanac things like, you know, the worm moon and the, the forest moon and all those things you can make up whatever you like. Most of those relate to the northern hemisphere, so to cultures in the northern hemisphere. So even though we kind of call them that really Maybe if we wanted to be more appropriate, we might switch it by six months and maybe call it the, the other alternatives for this at this time of the year would be oak moon. I don't think that's that relevant in Australia either. Cold moon, yes, my feet are saying that is absolutely correct. And the long night's moon, which is also true. Now, what's really cool about moons, in many Aboriginal cultures around Australia, the sun is actually a woman and the moon is a man. And the sun, of course, spends all of her time chasing the man around the sky. And it's really, really, really interesting because that's actually almost a reverse of a lot of the Western style of cultures like the Greeks and the Romans, where of course the, the moon is this, you know, gloriously cold woman and the man's like, <laughs> right? So it's really interesting that flip. Um, but of course, uh, you know, in any case, the moon is absolutely more important when we look back at these cultures that lived on the land and still live on the land. It's much more than just a light in the sky. It's a marker of seasonal change food and crop availability and, and, and weather. And there's one thing I just wanted to tell you about the Māori people. They actually didn't just have names for full moons. They had a name for every single moon in that cycle. And that would tell them what was good to eat and when. Some things are good to eat and some things at, at different times in the year, you know, might be poison now and it might be good later, right? So those things would actually dictate how they, how they actually went about their lives. It told them when weather was coming, when climate was changing, when seasons are happening, much like our people here in Australia. We've got a waning gibbon, gibbous. Does anybody know what gibbous means? I don't know, guess where it came from, the word? It's a trick question, the word is gibbous. Um, it's Latin, G-I-B-B-U-S. Does anybody know what it actually means in Latin? What is that? Mm, maybe, not the one I'm thinking of. I'm going to give you a hint. It's a hunch. Okay, not like a ha-ha, I've got a hunch that I have a hunch, but a hunch. And another sort of idea that goes with hunch is bulging. And that's why that, if you look, when you look in the sky, it really does look like it's like, just a little kind of like lazy on one side, right? So that's the gibbous moon. And that's on its way to the moon at the last quarter. Okay, so that's the 21st of June. And then, of course, what else is on the 21st of June? My feet are like, yes, we're going to get warm soon. Um, so, yes, we've got the solstice, which, of course, means? Correct, basically. Not everywhere on Earth, not all the time, not everywhere, but, but on average, yes. And does anybody know where solstice came from? Solstice. Did somebody say that? In the Latin? Oh yeah, you did, didn't you? So the sun stands still, all right? So that's where it kind of was just still in the sky. And of course, that goes back to many cultures around the earth as well as being a very, very important time because this is where people's feet actually were able to warm up again. And of course, they were actually coming into seasons where they might have food, which I don't know about you, it's kind of important. Then of course, we've got our crescent moon, a waning crescent, which means it's going away. And then new moon. There it is. There is actually a picture there. It's just a little bit uh, flooded out. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you about a couple of things you might want to look at at first quarter and then in the third quarter. The first quarter, well, just one thing actually, the mare fecunditatus. It's a Latin lesson today. It's the sea of fertility. But I can tell you right now, I ain't going there for anything. <laughs> okay? 
Uh, this is actually the site. If you're sitting here looking at this little area here, it's not one of the ones that people typically look at. You know, it's not the Tranquillitatis or the Serenity or anything like that. It's, it's Fecunditatis, which, let's be honest, is a bit of a mouthful. This is actually the site of where the Soviet Lunar's, Lunar 16 probe automated probe, no people, went down, picked up a sample and actually returned it to Earth for the first time. That was way back, a long time ago, and you know, we kind of haven't been back since for the 80s or so, like, is it still the same? Who knows? Yeah, I'm sure it probably is. Um, this mare is about 800 kilometres in diameter and it's lava-filled impact basin. So all of these mare or seas, these black areas, are usually where something's hit it and then the hot lava from underneath, because the moon was kind of lavery underneath in the early days, before it cooled down, kind of wells up and fills the bottom and that's why they're nice and smooth. And they're also really, really good places to have a look for the odd uh, crater. So when you actually zoom into these, having a look at the craters that are on top means that those craters are actually a little bit younger than those mare underneath as well. So you can start establishing a bit of a timeline. In the third quarter, for, the, um, for a waning gibbous or for the third quarter, I'm going to get you to have a look at Gassendi Crater. Now this is 110 kilometres of a diameter. It's quite small. You have to zoom right in and it's this shape here and that's actually Gassendi A on top as well. So it's actually got another crater. This crater itself is on top of Mare Humorum. So it was Mare Humorum first, then Gassendi Crater and then Gassendi A. And you can go one, two, three. So if you've got a scope, you can zoom right in and have a look at Gassendi A and that's a little bit younger. Now this again has been impact with lava flowing up. And if you've actually got a really good scope, you can zoom in on the surface of Gassendi and you can actually see fractures in the floor of it. Which honestly, what looking at fractures on another world that was made billions of years ago just blows my mind. And I only have to look at our closest satellite, natural satellite. <laughs> okay, so tomorrow morning when everyone's getting up really early, what can you see? Well, first of all, you can't see. What can't you see? Mercury? Oh, you can probably see Saturn. Uranus? Or Uranus? Or if you really, really, really want to say it, I'll let you say Uranus. Um, so we've got the sun rising, obviously, which is a good thing. Um, I enjoy that a lot every morning. And then we've got Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, but not in that order. It's a great time of the year for planets because pretty much they're all out. Pretty much. And as we go out through the year, or through the month, you'll find that they actually really do start to come out to play. So, for example, this is the 30th of June. You can go and look at this with your eyes, except for that one <laughs> and that one. You won't see them with your eyeballs. Not unless you've got an exceptional, like I'm talking, robotic eyeballs. Like, amazing ones, right? You'd, you'd struggle to do anything on, on else in, in life. Driving would be hard. Um, so yes, yeah, so if on the 30th of June, if you feel so inclined, you can head out in the uh, pre-dawn sky and you can actually see Venus, Uranus, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune and Saturn in this wonderful arc that, I don't know if you noticed, but it's kind of going from east all the way over sort of to the west. And that's the ecliptic. So during the daytime, that's where the sun actually travels as well, which is kind of cool. So basically, if you're lost and you can find these planets and you kind of know at about this time of the year where they are, you can sort of work out uh, where you're going. Um, so anyway, Mar Mercury will be there as well, but seriously, be really carefully, careful trying to look at Mercury. Mercury is always really low on the horizon because it's so close to the sun and it's very easy to make a mistake and end up looking Okay, so just be really, really careful. Best time to actually look at Mercury isn't in fact on the 30th of June, it's actually on the 15th of June. So in about a week, that will be when it's about 19 degrees above the horizon, which is almost its maximum elevation. So if you like looking at Mercury, feel free. But why would you want to look at Mercury? How boring, right? Well, on the 22nd of June, it's gonna be about 19 degrees above the horizon, really hard to see, but it'll be worth it because of something called dichotomy. Now, I love words. I'm really sorry I've been testing you today. 
Uh, what do we reckon that means? Half phase. Half phase. Essentially, yes, that, that, is, that is practically what it means. I've made it easy. There we go. Yeah, so basically into two, exactly. And usually two different parts. So sort of describing that juxtaposition between dark and light. So two parts, two mutually exclusive, opposed or contradictory groups. What does that have to do with Mercury? Well, when we look at the moon and we see that it is in its third quarter, it will look a lot like Mercury because Mercury actually has phases as well. And if you ever want to get a good picture and you can avoid the sun and get in quickly, this is the time to get a picture of the dichotomy, the actual phase of Mercury. Venus has it too, just uh, not quite at the moment. Okay, so conjunctions and pulses. First of all, what are they? Conjun conjunctions are basically when, uh, so everyone knows about uh, longitude on Earth. When we basically extend that into the sky, that's essentially what right ascension is. Now, when two objects in the sky share the same right ascension, which is just a coordinate, we call it a conjunction. Because of where we are on Earth, we don't actually see things next to each other or below when they share the right, same right ascension. They just tend to be close. Now, being close is exactly what a pulse means. So when things are close in the sky, by our sight, not necessarily in real life, it's not like Jupiter kind of comes in and says, hey Mars, and goes back out again, right? It's just there. When we see that, that's called a pulse, and things get close. But they're not necessarily having a right, uh, sharing the same coordinate, so they're not actually conjuncting. So there's a bunch of conjunctions this month. The moon is very busy. It's going to, first of all, start off by visiting Saturn. So this is actually an pulse, which is that little code up there for you. So A is a pulse. It does actually conjunct the moon the night before on the 18th, but it's actually further away than the 19th. So the 19th is a great time to find Saturn if you've never seen it. Find the moon on the 19th, there's Saturn in that sort of arrangement. Please, this is obviously not to scale. <laughs> Next time, so the two, two, look two thirds of the way up from the horizon. The next one for you to have a look at is on the 22nd of June. This is just before the dawn in the highest point. You need to look about halfway up from the north horizon. Again, there's a conjunction on the 21st of June, but the moon's actually further away from Jupiter with that. So it's better to have a look at this time. That's, this is pro probably best done with your, with your naked eye, by the way. Uh, so, uh, 23rd of June, the next night, we actually have a real conjunction, which means that the right ascension of Mars, the coordinate, and the coordinate for the Moon will be the same. Doesn't mean they're in the same place in the sky, because there's, of course, a declination as well. So, uh, we're having a look there. Oh, everyone has to just get up really early, basically. I'm making you all early birds. Uh, okay, also on the 23rd of June, there'll be a lunar occultation. What does that mean? Well, the Moon's actually going to pass in between us the planet and the moon sort of sweeps in between. Now, because the angle's got to be perfect, not everyone gets to see it. And unfortunately, unless you're planning a really awesome trip down there, you are not going to see it. I'm really sorry. I know I got your hopes up. Sad face. <laughs> okay, uh, so we've also got, and this is my favorite, and I'm sorry to everybody watching that knows that it's Uranus, I'm going to say this anyway. The moon is going to pass in front of Uranus. Let that sink in. It's awful, isn't it? I should never say that again. So we've got a lunar occultation, which means the, loon's part, the moon is passing in between our line of sight and the thing we're looking at, uh, of, of Uranus, which is kind of cool. We don't, unfortunately, <laughs> get to see that either, unless you're planning a trip to that little spot in the w, in WA, which incidentally, Alan, I used to actually be a gold, I used to work in a gold mine as a geologist. And there is a mine about there called Jundi that mines gold. So there you go. Something you didn't need to know, but you know it now. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> okay. And finally, uh, we've got Venus as well. So the moon's been very, going to be very, very busy. We've got Saturn, we've got Jupiter, we've got Mars, Uranus, and Venus. Right? So if you don't know where these planets are and you're just starting out, this is a perfect way to do it. That'll be the 26th of June. All right, uh, Neptune, I don't know if you've been plotting it lately, but if you had been plotting the position of Neptune every night, you would discover that it has been going in an easterly direction through the constellations. 
which is what we call prograde or forward. Now, on this date, on the 28th of June, because you're all taking lots of data, you're going to notice that the next night, on the 29th, or 28th, 29th, it's going to go the other way. It doesn't really move. This is actually why the Greeks called them wanderers, because they kind of just did random stuff in the sky. They were like, oh, no, actually, I want to go back over there. I mean, I should have just called it, like, my sister's a bit like that, right? No, she's not. She's actually very decisive. She's a nurse and she knows what to do. Um, so <laughs> this is basically where prograde and retrograde come from. This is on my Instagram, so feel free to have a look. I am very aware of time. But essentially, it's really just the fact that we are not the centre of the universe. Well, I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, those of you with a scope, an asteroid challenge, because I love asteroid challenges. Does anybody know what one this one is? Who knew that? You're amazing. Fantastic. So this is, this is for Vesta. So this is an asteroid in the asteroid belt. Viewing this gets even better towards the end of the month, but it's actually quite good to see at the moment. It's at a visual magnitude of about 7.18. Um, it's going to reach 65 to 66 degrees above the north horizon and then fade in the northwest. So it's actually quite high. This is actually um, one of the asteroids that, that has the largest variation in brightness. So it'll get really bright and then it'll be like, nah, just having a break. All right? Um, so Vesta was found by a guy called Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers. Same guy with Olbers Paradox. Yeah. Um, I'm going to look that up. Um, and he was actually looking for fragments of this sort of destroyed planet because he saw uh, Ceres and Pallas in that area and he was like, oh, there's definitely been a destroyed planet. He was looking for bits and pieces, but he found Vesta instead. That theory is being debunked, but we're kind of glad he found Vesta. So it's actually one of the largest asteroids. It has about 9% of all of the of asteroids that we know of their material. So 9% of asteroid material in the belt is in Vesta. So it's, it's a big boy, okay? <laughs> and also, does anybody know where this sort of came from? Do you know why we can see this? It was also... Uh, one of the, f the first asteroid to be visited um, by a spacecraft, by Dawn. Dawn, yeah, by Dawn, I told you. It's, it's all about Dawn, this talk. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you don't want to use your scope, lay back and relax. And let's have a look at a constellation. It's not a constellation that all of you know, all of you probably um, love so much as Sagittarius or, you know, honestly, my favourite, what's your favourite asterism? The little teapot or something, isn't it? That's your favourite asterism, isn't it? Yeah, Marx is a teapot. But I've chosen Ophiuchus for a reason. Now, it wasn't because he's the Greek god of medicine, possibly. They think it's linked back to the Greek god of medicine called Asclepius. Um, but you can certainly see why that might be with that serpent. And know all the, the daggers with the serpent going down? That's that story. Um, to me, look, I struggle to find <laughs> Ophiuchus in these stars, but I actually struggle with most of them. There are a couple of them, like Crux, that I have no problem with, um, but the rest of them I find a bit difficult. So if you're like me, that is also around the wrong way. Um, if you're like me, these things from Stellarium really, really help, and if you don't have Stellarium, definitely download it. Uh, here we go, we've got Ophiuchus. Unfortunately for us, this is how we see it. He's upside down, okay? But frankly, with my views on uh, cruelty to animals, and he's doing that to a snake, I'm okay with that. All right. This is probably the star you will see first, the brightest star, or actually, you'll probably see that one first. And if you really want to see, if you want to find where this constellation is, the easiest thing to do is to either look for this brightest star, which of course is called Razel Hage, or well, it depends if you're German or not, I suppose, which is Arabic for head of the serpent collector, kind of goes without saying. And otherwise, start at Antares, go down and then look for this kind of upside down teapot. And I'm not talking about those nice little round ceramic cozy teapots that my grandmother had in England. I'm talking about those like metal kind of industrial looking ones that burn you. All right, they're the ones I'm talking about, just so you know. Uh, so why did I say Ophiuchus? It's not because I want you to know about Greek mythology. It's because it's actually situated just north of the Milky Way plain, where all the interesting stuff is. So it's really, really rich in globular clusters, which are gorgeous, really good for, um, for taking photos of. And they all sort of sit in a kind of sphere around the galaxy centre. So it's not really that surprising that when we look out into that direction, we see lots of them. 
So 16 of these globular clusters are actually brighter than 10th magnitude. So at, on any given day, if you're there, have a look there. It's not that far. You can do it. I thought I'd, thought I'd talk to you about three things that you might find in, in Ophiuchus's leg. <laughs> okay, so that's Subic. That's that corner star. If I can go back, that's this one right here. Okay, so in between... Cool. Technology. Uh, so in between there and the end of his leg, we've got three things here. We've got M9, which most of you would be pretty familiar with, I would imagine. Yes? And then we've got NGC 6356. Familiar-ish? Yeah? And who knows about the Dark Horse Nebula? Mark's like, oh, Lee's got it? Oh, yeah, Lee, sorry. <laughs> got a big camera in front of you, Lee. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've got three I thought I might show you today. This one, of course, is M9, a.k.a. NGC uh, 6333, or MEL 167. Um, this is about 25,000 light years away, and it is one of the closest globular clusters to the centre of our Milky Way. And it is so close, at about 5,500 light years, the gravity there stops it being beautifully globular and actually kind of flattens it out a little bit more. So if you're really careful and you have a good look at it, you'll see that it's probably not as nice and round as you might expect. Um, it has about 120,000 times the luminosity of our sun, but the stars in here are about twice as old and they're a lot less dirty or they have a lot less metals in them. So they haven't actually been processed by star activity as much as we have around here. Okay, so these are absolutely beautiful. While you're looking at that, just think this is pristine and it's also suffering from the gravitational effects from being, you know, five and a half thousand light years away from the centre of our Milky Way. NGC 6356, also known as MEL 171. She put her name on a lot of things, didn't she, Mel? Um, so this has, a, this has a visual magnitude of 8.2. This is quite close to M9. So if you are having a little observation of M9, I really, really, really encourage you to go and have a look at this one. This one isn't, isn't as exciting. It's about the same size. It's twice as far from Earth. So M9 is 25,000 light years. This one's about 50,000 light years. This was discovered way back in 1784, and it's quite dense and full of metals. So quite different to M9. It's full of metals and they think that the, the centre of it's really, really dusty, right? It's had a lot of reprocessing of stars going on in there. Um, yeah, so it's, quite, it's quite, quite an interesting comparison in such a close area of sky. Of course, they're not in the same part of the sky at all. Now, this one is absolutely beautiful and I kind of, I'm not sure if you can see it. Can you see that okay? I haven't got much more. Can everyone see a dark horse Prancing horse or great dark horse? <laughs> Can anyone see it? I want you to all do this. It's actually gorgeous and it is huge. Don't get your massive scope out to look at this. You will not fit it in. Now this is uh, 10 degrees on the sky. <laughs> By seven. Yeah, slightly less. I'll just take a finger. Okay. 10 by 7. How big's the moon on the sky in terms of uh, how much? About half. Yeah, it's about half. Right? So, thumb. Yeah. That's enormous. And it's beautiful. Uh, and actually, interestingly enough, the Incas made this constellation very similarly, but they didn't call it a horse, they called it a llama. <laughs> well, it's kind of obvious, right? Um, it was also very, very obvious, um, very, very bright in that area of the world. Uh, so this has actually been known about since the early 1900s, and it's actually comprised of many, many separate dark nebulae. So you probably see that there's sort of a big globby there. This is called the Pipe Nebula in total, but there's a bunch of different Barnard nebulae in there as well. Uh, and then there's a whole one here. It's got that beautiful leg that's curled up, and a much fainter leg down there, and its head. Now, there's probably, oh, I'm not probably, I can read them all off to you, but they all start with B and they all have numbers afterwards and I don't think it's going to mean much. There's probably between 10 and 15, I'd say, different dark nebulae in there, which is absolutely beautiful. You can just sit there and just be like, okay, I 
and just trace the legs of that gorgeous horse. Um, so of course most people would know that dark nebulae are in fact, like kind of what Alan was talking about before, dark nebulae, they look like nothing, but they're exactly the opposite. They've got so much stuff, so much dust and all that sort of stuff that it's stuff from behind can't get through. It's essentially the same as you can't see the stream behind me. All right, so this dust is absorbing and it's blocking all the light from behind. And we typically see them when they're lit up from behind by bright stars or, or by glowing gas. Um, some people can actually see, and you won't see it here because I've deliberately cropped it off. I've left it as a little thing for you to do. Some people can actually see a rider. So I'm gonna leave that to you to have a look at this in the sky and potentially online, I'm guessing Google's gonna get a hit tonight and see if you can find the rider on this dark horse. And finally, before I let you go, we've actually got a comet that's visiting. Has anybody heard of this comet before? No, it's kind of a bit odd. Like, it's got a really, really sexy name, right? Like, C2017 K2 Panstars. When I find a comet, that's what I'm calling it. No, I'm, I'm actually going to call it banana. Um, <laughs> definitely, I get to call it banana. Um, so this is in Ophiuchus tonight and it will uh, be traveling in our skies. Uh, it's going to brighten until about August. It reaches perihelion December 19. I don't know why I remember that date of all of the ones, but it's gonna um, be at perihelion at December 19. If you do not see this, you will never see this. It's not coming back. This, just to end on this, this has actually come from the Oort cloud. Okay, the freezing cold, frigid Oort cloud that's right way beyond our solar system and contains some of the most incredibly pristine material. We can't get any of that in our solar system, really. So it's actually just bringing it in for us. And the other interesting thing about this, um, so this has been traveling for millions of years. This photo was taken in 2017 and was the furthest away thing, uh, comet, ever seen. So this was taken by Hubble, it was discovered by Panstars, shock, uh, and then it was imaged by Hubble. So this was taken in 2017. It's now quite a lot closer, but at this point in time, it was beyond the orbit of Saturn. And it hadn't actually started to make a tail yet. So this is something I really, if you, if you love comets, or even if you only slightly like comets, or even if you're indifferent, you know, you never know what you might find out. See if you can find this. It's in Ophiuchus tonight. I told you I'd have a summary page and I skipped straight over it. <laughs> I'll put it up for you in case you want a photo. Um, I should also note that if you ever want to find the ISS, there's a wonderful website by NASA called Spot the Station. Uh, and a lot of these other things um, are sort of found all over the internet. Stellarium is fantastic. So please take a photo or get out of your way. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Claire, for a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you, Alan, for a wonderful talk. Yeah. Greatly appreciated. Um, for those of you who are